Good morning again, everyone here. Good morning, our online audience, whoever will be watching this recording. Uh, we pray that you've had a blessed Sunday and that you're continuing to have it when you see this. Uh, a couple quick news and announcements as we begin. Just another reminder, and I'm going to be talking about this for the next couple months, so get used to the speech. Um, our Advent uh, Zoom online book study is going to be on God is in the Manger. It is an Advent daily devotional um, that was compiled from the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This book is excellent. You can purchase this on Amazon, Christianbook.com, GoodBooks.com. You can find it online. You can find it in paperback. You can find it hardcover. You can get it at Bull Moose here in Waterville. They will order it for you. Uh, anywhere between $10 to $14. It is absolutely an excellent, excellent book. Uh, it's something that you won't be reading a chapter of, but you'll be reading a page of every day as a nice devotional throughout the holiday season. And then we will be meeting on Sunday starting on November 27th at 1 p.m. online, Zoom, so you do it right from the comfort of your own house, um, to discuss kind of like what the week has been. Uh, there'll be a little bit of study with it, a little bit of reflection, maybe some testimony. I think it'll be an excellent, excellent time to prepare us for the holiday Christmas season. So uh, send me an email, send me a communication, a bat signal, whatever you need to do to get to know me. If you want to participate in the study, uh, we're going to have multiple churches participating. Again, I've already had a committed from commitment from Riverside. They will be joining as well. So uh, it'll be nice. It'll be I, it'll be a really good study. I'm really excited about this one. So let me know via email if you want to participate so I can make sure that you're on list and you can see communication. Um, the second announcement that I have is next Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, instead of having our Bible study, we'll be doing our church leadership meeting. So if you're an elder, if you're a deacon, um, if you're an organist and you want to participate, more than welcome to if you're a clerk. Um, we will be here at 9 a.m. talking about what the fall and uh, coming into winter will look like, um, as well as recap some of the other stuff we talked at the last meeting. So uh, please make sure that if you're a member of Smithfield Baptist Church leadership that you are here at 9 a.m. next Sunday. Um, for another announcements. Um, I was notified by one of our deacons that... Um, they were reading an article, a sign article, talking about food pantries in our area that are really, really struggling right now. Uh, they had highlighted the Waterville or the Winslow Food Cupboard, who has done a lot, like a massive amount of work for the community. Temple Academy partners with them with student volunteers so the kids can get their volunteer hours. They're struggling, obviously, for donations. They're struggling for volunteers. They're struggling for everything. Uh, I'm going to come out and speak with Nikki this week to see how our food pantry is doing. So I'll have an update at some point during the Gospel of Daybreaks of the week. I don't know what day I'll be out here to see her um, to see how that one's going. But just be mindful, especially when you head back down to Connecticut. Be mindful because if the food pantries around us have a lot more mouths than volunteers and people, then no doubt that's not just a central main unique problem. Uh, but if you have an opportunity, you have time that you'd like to volunteer, let me know. I'll find a way to connect you with some resources. I know there's always help that can be done. Uh, if you feel God moving in your heart um, to start dedicating some donations in the wicker basket for the food pantry on top of everything, uh, we'll make sure we go know where that's going. I know where the leadership will talk about doing a dedicated donation out of our community outreach fund. Uh, for Winslow and maybe for Smithfield. Also reminding everyone that we are preparing for oil season. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys watch the news, but uh, fuel prices aren't exactly cheap right now. Um, so there'll be a lot of people who could probably barely cover their heating expenses last year that now are asked to pay in some cases 15, 50 to 75% more. Um, it's hard. It's hard all around. So. Um, I thoroughly believe that we're going to have every opportunity to volunteer and serve in the fall and winter this year. Uh, and I pray that God just guides you guys to all participate. But look forward to more information this week on that. I'll give you an update as we have that. Um, those are all the specific announcements that I have for this week. So let us now take a moment of silent reflection and prayer to 
Actually, was there one person in the congregation that wanted to have an announcement during the announcement time? Robin. Uh, well, the carpet work will be done by our service team. So we'll yes. Sure. So the, it will uh, be done also the following week, which is uh, the 18th. 18th. Okay, so no Sunday morning Bible study. Um, the next two weeks. We'll have our leadership meeting next week and then we will be off for that following um, Sunday. Perfect. I've covered the announcements. All right, let us take a moment of silent reflection and prayer to center ourselves into God present, God's presence and then we'll start singing some hymns and reading from God's word. Let us call ourselves to worship in song. Please open your hymnals to number 54, He is the Lord. We will open with a praise chorus to prepare our worship. Number 54, 5 4. standing for our first formal hymn of today's service. It is number 379, Nearer My God to Thee. 379, we are going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5.
may be seated. Please now take out your Bibles to Psalm number 10. It's on page 532. Psalm number 10. I should probably turn there as well, huh? Nope, I am here. Look at that. I'm prepared for once. All right, we're going to do this responsive reading a little different than previous. I am going to read verses 1 through 4. You will read verses 5 through 10, and then I will take it home with the rest of it. So you'll be reading verses 5 through 10. You'll stop at the beginning of verse 11. (laughs) And you'll begin at the beginning of verse 10. I say that because this is the first time I've ever done it this way. And I fully see myself as well as maybe you guys messing up. That was as much for me as it was for you. All right, verse 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek all his thoughts. As they say, there is no God. If his ways prosper at all times, your judgments are on high, how are you silent? Yet to all his fellows he talks of us like this. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you know mischief and vexation, that you may, not take, it, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have, made, you have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his hands. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is on earth may strike terror no more. Amen. Let us take a moment of reflection and prayer. Let's not take a moment. Let me lead into, again, new bulletin. Got myself caught on that one. It's going to happen a like hundred times for the next three weeks since we've changed stuff, so don't worry. All right. Uh, okay, let's, let me lead us now in our pastoral prayer. Lord, thank you for being such an awesome God. Thank you for mercy and grace and love and peace. Thank you for sending your son to the cross so that we may be saved. Lord, we're reminded in this psalm today that the wicked around us feel like there is no God, but we know better we worship you. They feel like their actions will go without judgment, but we know better because of your promises. They feel like they can do what they want to those not only faithful, but those in the world who are most desperate. 
and most struggle. But we know, Lord, that you will hold them to account. That one day you will judge them for the sins they have committed. That you will hold them accountable for their errors and their mistakes. So, Lord, as we look at the world around us, let us be reminded of your promises. There is evil in our communities. But you have overcome the world. There is pain and suffering even among our brothers and sisters. But you have promised us an eternity where that is no more. There is sadness and depression and anxiety in our community. But you have promised a world where there will be no more tears. So Lord, I pray that you come swiftly. And that while we patiently wait on you, that you lessen our sufferings, our afflictions. That we see those who do evil be held accountable, not only in your eventual heavenly court, Lord, but now in our modern courts. We pray that our brothers and sisters are protected and are looked after. We pray that you are with us as we worship you, that we are guided by your hand and by your words, Lord. Be with us, we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, thank you. Let us move on to our next hymn, our second hymn, Be Thou My Vision. It's number 359. We will sing verses 1 and 4. 359. Please remain standing as we pray for our world and we lead ourselves into the doxology after the Lord's Prayer. Oh Lord, I pray that you are with our community. I pray that you are with all of those in need. Lord, I ask that you use us to help fill the food banks with volunteers and with funding. But Lord, I pray that there will be a day in which Food banks' lines are not nearly as long. Lord, I pray that you are with our government officials, that they may make wise decisions, and that, Lord, that you guide them, whether they know it or not, that you bring your moral code, that you bring your word to bring justice into this world, not the schemes or plots of men. I pray that you be with all of us as we worship you, that you be with our brothers and sisters across this country, that you bring peace and healing. And Lord, I pray that you are with those who go to church in far off lands who no doubt could be martyred for the very act of worshiping you, Lord. I pray that you keep them safe. I pray for peace in our world. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. Look after us as we worship you. Be with us. Let us feel your holy presence. And Lord, as faithful response to your Son, let us recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's recite the doxology together. seated. And trust me, you'll be seated for a little while, so don't, don't panic with the new structure. Um, today's reading of the Word is Daniel chapter 10. It's also what I will be preaching on. Daniel chapter 10. You'll, pay, you'll find it on page 1,242 in my Bible. I'm just kidding. Page 888 in your Bibles. See, that wouldn't have helped you. It would have been 400 pages off. Look at that. It's not that mine has more stuff. It's just verse by verse, so all the verses start at the end, so there's more pages. That's, that's why mine's bigger. Longer. All right. Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was of great conflict, and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my body, nor did I anoint myself at all for a full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris. I lifted up my eyes, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of, brush, of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of the multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but had a great trembling upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw the great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face on the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. Um, and when he had spoken these words, I stood up trembling. Then he said, Fear not, Daniel, for the for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia. And came, uh, and came to me... And came to make you understand what has happened to your people in the later days, or the latter days. For the vision is for the days to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and was mute. And behold, the one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and spoke. I said uh, to him who was before me, O Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. 
How can my Lord's servant talk to my Lord? For now no strength remains in me and no breath is in me. Again, having, um, again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And he said, and I said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the princes of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you all that is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except Michael, your prince. All right. That, my friends, is a mouthful and an objectively terrifying moment if you are Daniel. But let me open up my... So I'm not going to shuffle back and forth in my Bible today. I'm going to uh, just pull up my iPad in proper. I've highlighted the compare and contrast passages that we're looking at in a few moments. I'm going to do it this way. All right. I'm now prepared. Took longer than usual. It's been a long day. All right. So we're at Daniel chapter 10 now as we go through our Daniel. And if we're, if we're not careful, we might mistake it almost as an introduction to the big prophecy that we see in Daniel chapter 11. I talked about it a few weeks ago. Uh, Daniel chapter 11 is such a precise and accurately fulfilled prophecy that if we, um, that if anyone wanted to refute the authenticity of the Bible, they would have to find a way to disprove how this would happen. Most scholars who try to refute the Bible, scholars, um, do so by saying that this couldn't possibly have happened before the events because it's so accurate. It's so supernatural. It's so miraculous, the prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, that it had to have happened after, the skeptics will say. Well, the only problem with that is we have evidence that this scroll existed before the prophecies actually happened. So um, the scholars have to generally like refute evidence to be able to justify their opinion. It's fun. It's complicated. We'll talk about that next week because we're in Daniel chapter 10 today. Daniel chapter 10 essentially is an introduction, but it is a powerful, powerful moment. And something very, very important is happening here. The sermon title, which I take for granted of you guys being able to read with bullets in your hands, uh, is kind of my first, my main point that I have here. The sermon title today is, It's Not Always the Battles You See. It's Not Always the Battles You See. That is the heart of essentially this mission, uh, this message in Daniel chapter 10. Um, but before that, i got to give you guys a little setting and background because I like doing that, right? So what is the setting of this eventual vision in chapter 11, uh, the final vision of Daniel? Well, the setting is in the third year of King Cyrus in Persia. Daniel is still in Babylon, essentially. Uh, he does not come back. He is a very old man. Uh, he's anywhere between 80 to 90 years old at this point. He's not a spring chicken, so he's not ready to travel back to Jerusalem. So he is still being a faithful member of the Jewish people living in Babylon. It's known as the diaspora, if you've ever heard that term. He's being a member of the diaspora. Um, and he gets this word as he's dealing with a great conflict, it says. Daniel says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. Well, why would Daniel be mourning? We're not specifically given reason here, but if we use the word of God to teach the word of God, then we can look at a couple moments that are happening around the third year of King Cyrus that might make Daniel anxious. Um, first of all, the Jewish people were allowed to return to the province of Yehud in Persia um, in the first year of King Cyrus. So they've returned back. It's celebration. It's joy. It's the first wave of exiles. They're going back. We have the writings in Ezra. As the book of Ezra covers like decades upon decades upon decades of years. But at the beginning of Ezra, they know like this big moment, the first exile is returning. Um, but there was conflict. They weren't getting done what they wanted to get done. 
The temple, three years into it, wasn't rebuilt as they intended to do. They were struggling with funding. The walls still didn't exist. Um, there was just still a lot of politics and conflict and the letters in Ezra going back and forth about funding and threats and this and that were still very real. It's a time of conflict. Even though they have returned, they weren't accomplishing their missions. So we see like the prophets Haggai, who writes the book of Haggai, the prophet Zechariah, who writes the book of Zechariah, talk about this time as well. They talk about the conflict. Zechariah is prophesying that the temple will be rebuilt. He's doing that around now, but he's doing that in Jerusalem, in Yehud. Uh, in the area that was, it used to be Judah, but it wasn't the size of Judah at the time of Persia. It was roughly a little bit bigger than the size of Jerusalem, Yehud. He was back there prophesying there with Haggai, and they were doing that in that area. Daniel was doing his part from Babylon. The temple's not rebuilt. That is a problem for the Jewish people. They've returned, but they haven't returned, if that makes sense. There's still conflict. There's still debate. Um, some of the prophets talk about people being content to live in ruined cities. Like, this is a problem, and Daniel is struggling with this. And so Daniel decides that he's going to fast for three weeks. He doesn't do it on a whim. He does it to prepare for a very specific event. And we see Daniel here. He says that for three weeks, 21 days, I ate no delicacies, no meat, no wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself. Well, that's pretty interesting. Because that kind of refutes the authors of the Daniel diet book, who says Daniel is our best example for how we should eat, right? You know, back in Daniel chapter 1, you get, you have the story of Daniel saying, I'm only going to eat vegetables. Do you remember way back in my sermon then that I said that was less about a lifestyle change that you had to make? And more about Daniel choosing to control something he could control and God using that as a miracle to show his power and sovereignty back in Daniel chapter 1? Well, this is kind of holds true here because guess what? If Daniel is saying, I was mourning and I ate no delicacies or meat or wine, what does that imply? That for the last several decades, he's been eating meat and wine and delicacies, right? He has a traditional Jewish diet at this point. It's not just vegetables. So Daniel has abstained from all that. He's going to a period of Prayer, repentance, petition, worship with the Lord. He is mourning um, this big pain into the arrival of, in verse 4, the 24th day of the first month. Raise your hand if you were an expert at the Jewish calendar. My hand's not really up. This is an example. I'm not an expert at the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is tricky because it's a lunar calendar, so it doesn't match up with our wonderful January, February, March, April. Raise your hand, though, if you know what is specific about the 24th day of the first month. Oh, I love this. The 24th day of the first month is a pretty important day. Like, an important, important day. The 24th day of the first month is Passover. Daniel is fasting up to Passover. Passover... It's an important day for us still to this day. Passover is the holiday in which Jews remind themselves that God has delivered them out of Egypt. And he did so by passing over their houses if they had blood on the outside. Which, for a th several thousand years, was a faithful example but a shadow of of the Christ to come, which we now celebrate as Jesus' Last Supper, which was the Passover meal, because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the Paschal Lamb. So Daniel is preparing for Passover, but he's not preparing for Passover with his family and his friends. He's doing other things. He's in mourning for it, likely because Passover wasn't happening with a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. If we were to sit on a Passover with a traditional Jewish family who is Orthodox, faithfully following, one thing is always said at the end of it, next year in Jerusalem, they chant it. The Diaspora Jews have been saying that for the entire period. They say it now to this day, next year in Jerusalem, like God will return, God will restore. That's a 
Passover cry that has been happening for thousands of years, this is one that Daniel is ideally having. He's not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in a state of disrepair, even though it's been a few years since they've moved back. Progress hasn't been happening. It is a moment of mourning. And so Daniel, being faithful, is doing all he can. He can't physically go there as a 90-year-old man and start throwing up bricks in the temple. He's doing all that he can. He is fighting a spiritual battle, and that is the point that we're talking about. He is mourning. He is taking a moment. And God hears him, and God sends a messenger to him with a message that is ultimately so encouraging, so powerful, so accurate, um, that skeptics can't answer it other than trying to not answer it. Um, this is a very, very powerful moment. God's doing a lot of stuff at this time. God's working through um, the people in Jerusalem. He's working through Haggai. He's working through Zechariah. He's working through probably other prophets that we don't have scripture of anymore. He's working through Daniel. God is doing a lot. And so Daniel has this vision. He has this vision as he describes, he says, in verse 5, as I looked up my eyes, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a fine belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and legs um, like a gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words was like the sound of a multitude. <coughs> that has to be an intimidating, intimidating scene to behold. And this is where I kind of break away. I'm going to give you a couple examples of who this man might be. I'm not going to give you anything authoritative of who this would be. Because I have three different commentaries that I use on Daniel. I have five different study Bibles. I have an entire book dedicated to Daniel. And I sat down with a pastor peer friend of mine as we go through Daniel chapter 10. And guess what we determined? Nobody agrees on who this person is. I'm going to give you who I think is the likeliest, and I'll give you the pros and cons of who this visionary could be. Um, but know that there are other, what I would argue, credible sources that refute this claim, and I'll give you a little bit of that. The first who is this man moment that we want to talk about is, is this the pre-incarnate Christ? known as a Christophany. Christophany is a fancy word to say Jesus has done work on earth, interacting with people, before he was actually a baby in the manger. That's what pre-incarnate means. This is the first example that, and the most common example from my sources has said that this could be Daniel having experience with the second person of the Godhead, the pre-incarnate Christ. And the connections that they made for that, admittedly, are compelling. They look at this passage that I just read to describe this person that Daniel's seeing, and they compare it with another person who deals with a glorified Christ. And what did they see? And so we jump ahead, definitely ahead, to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. In Revelation chapter 1, the Apostle John has a vision of the end of days. And during this vision, he's writing out letters to seven different churches. Um, a man arrives in front of him, and this is how they describe him. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. His head, the hairs of his head were white. They were like a white wool. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. That is very close to Daniel's experience. In fact, I could argue that if you took two different witnesses and showed them the same thing, it would be hard for both of those people to be as accurately close to that specific thing as Daniel and John were. So it makes it potential 
that Daniel and John are both seeing the same thing. Now, why does that maybe make that the pre-incarnate Christ speaking with Daniel? It's because, well, Revelation, John outrightly tells us that this is Jesus who he is seeing. Like, this is who the person is. There is no qualms in Revelation that's a Jesus. So they argue if that was Jesus and this person looks exactly like him, that must be Jesus. And that's not the only compelling argument that I heard about it. Another compelling argument is comparing Daniel chapter 10, verse 7, with the experiences that Paul has when Jesus appears to him in his glorified state to stop him. Daniel chapter 10, verse 7 says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but had a great trembling upon them, and they fled to hide. While when we go to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, it says, Now as he went on his way, Paul approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but arise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So both of them have elements of the person's getting a full-time experience, and the people around him are not participating in it. They know something's happening, but they're not participating in it. So that's the second core argument that people would make that this could be a pre-incarnate Christ. The final one is that the experience that Daniel has is very in line with the experience that other people have when they come into the presence of God proper. When we look at Daniel, his strength leaves him, he falls to the ground, he falls asleep, I would argue he probably faints. He falls asleep out of fear and trembling. He has no strength. He has no power. He is standing behind in front of glory. He realizes his inadequacy to be there. And so he doesn't know what to do. And so what eventually happens as we go furthest? I says, again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. Uh, where is it? Oh, I lost it. Okay. So Daniel is terrified. He says, when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and I was mute. Daniel has the vision. He's down the ground. He's mute, right? And behold, the one with the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. That is incredibly similar to how Isaiah is treated in Isaiah chapter 6 in the throne room. When Isaiah is whirled up to God's glory, he realizes, I am an unclean man and of unclean lips. He cannot speak. And it's not until a seraphim takes a coal from the altar and touches his lips before he is cleansed enough to speak in the presence of God. Daniel and Isaiah have that same experience, but we see Paul being blinded on the road to Damascus is another example of God's glory just overwhelming the human senses. We also see Peter having the same response when Peter recognizes that Jesus is Lord. Does anyone remember Peter's first response in the Gospels? When he recognizes after the fish, the net was filled with fish, the first thing he says, he falls, he's like, I am not worthy. That's the first response people have when they truly experience God. I am not worthy. And so, those who argue that this could be a pre-incarnate Christ point to all of those different moments and say, you see, 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 see? This is Jesus interacting in the world, second member of the Godhead, before he's a baby in a manger. Should I, should I pitch our study? God in the manger? Before he's God in the manger? Coming on November 27th. Sorry. Before that happens... This is the argument. Now, the con that every argument and commentary that I saw that says this is a problem, this is a con, um, the biggest takeaway that they had was that we see in Daniel chapter uh, 10, verse 13, it says, as he's saying, he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. They argue that if this was truly Christ, truly the second member of the Godhead, he wouldn't need help from an angel to overcome something. 
That is their argument. And the argument is so sound that though we're not given a name, one of my commentaries just outright calls this, uh, this being Gabriel because Gabriel had come to Daniel a couple other times. And they're just like, this is Gabriel. And they had a little footnote. Can't be Christ because Christ cannot be overcome. Except, you know, in the lives of all the people who reject Christ, right? The millions of people around us who don't ultimately come to him as Lord and Savior. Um, I think that that's not theologically super, super strong. The argument that I best make against it, and I truly say that I am not uh, in one camp or the other, so to speak. Again, I kept the main thing, the main thing, but I wanted to explain all this. So I'm not telling you with authority that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. I'm just giving you the evidence, and I'll let you guys study further. Um, the thing that would make me most question whether or not this is truly the incarnate Christ showing up is, first, if it's going to be a Christophany, we have to know that Christophanies exist. Like, it would have to be a thing that actually happens because the Bible teaches the Bible. And so that would lead us down the road of having to study characters like the angel of the Lord, who we see in the Old Testament, who people talk to like they have the authority of God, or to see other moments and other visions that happen. So, is this the pre-incarnate Christ? Many of my sources say it is. Am I completely sold on it? I'll probably ask Jesus when I get there. Hey, was this you back in Daniel? And he'll solve it for me. But that's not the point that I wanted to even bring up out of this message. I gave you the background because that's, that's the fun stuff. And I felt really bad a couple weeks ago when I kept all the fun stuff out of Daniel for me because I found the message earlier. So I wanted to give you a little bit of the fun stuff. What I want you to take away from this is we're about to move into Daniel chapter 11. And Daniel chapter 11 is shockingly accurate on worldly affairs, right? What we find out here in Daniel chapter 10 is, as the ser my sermon title say, it's not always the battles you see. The conflict in the world is always ultimately a spiritual conflict. There are forces and powers that are controlling the kings of Persia, that are controlling the Greeks. Daniel impacted this simply by mourning and praying and fasting and pleading to God. He participated against this conflict. Because it says here, he says in verse 12, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. Daniel, 21 days prior, when he said, I'm going to mourn and I am going to worship God in this manner to plead for his people. I'm going to humble myself. The second he did that, things were in motion. Now in the world, Daniel was going without, I don't know what delicacies were then. We'll just say cupcakes for the fun of it, but that's probably not scripturally accurate. Daniel was going without cupcakes and steak for three weeks. And just because Daniel probably didn't see anything changing, aside from missing cupcakes, I don't think they had high fructose corn syrup back then, so he probably wasn't having like massive DTs um, from the stuff that he was withholding him from. Trust me, it ain't no joke now. Like if you try to give up Hershey's now, it's practically cocaine at this point, that stuff. They really said it to be addicting. I went through it, trust me. Um, he's probably not going through that. He's feeling that, that constriction. But at this point, Daniel is absolutely participating in a spiritual battle, a spiritual conflict that supersedes, that is above, but is also guiding and controlling the worldly forces. And this is important for us to remember. We see as he continues down a little further in verse 20, he says, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Like the spiritual conflicts that are happening in the world. That this 
pre-incarnate Christ or otherwise, is relaying and talking about, is going on, is happening behind the scenes of everything. And that is really important for us to remember because as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can get discouraged. We can see worldly events, we can see community events, we can see politics, we can see our neighbors being atheist and hating God, we can see everything around us, and we can feel disjointed, and we can feel lost, and we can feel hopeless. But it's not about them. It's not the fight and the battles that we see. It's about the greater spiritual conflict that God is embattled with above and beyond everything. And I tell you that to give you hope. Because I don't care what amendment they post in Washington, D.C., or in Augusta, Maine, or in Moscow, or in Beijing. I don't care what view any of them have. It doesn't matter because if they're not standing with God, they've already lost. Because the fight's not with the earth. The earth is dying. It's rotting. As Paul says, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's like they've lost and they don't even know it yet if they're on the wrong side. God is fighting a spiritual battle. God is winning a spiritual battle battle. And it may not seem like that day in and day out. Daniel obviously fasting. Daniel was obviously in distress about whatever worldly events, Jerusalem or otherwise, he was struggling with. Daniel couldn't see Jesus Christ coming. He couldn't see the cross. It was too far in front of him. God is going to win. We worship a Lord who's already won. We have revelation. I just read out of it. And I say that not only to encourage you in a season that could look very dark, but also to remind you that it's easy for us to look at the governments and princes and authorities as these big, bad, evil things. But at the end of the day, our neighbors are having the same fight. If we have a neighbor who is skeptical of the gospel, they're in a spiritual war. They don't even know it. They're rejecting being a part of it, but they're in it. Whether they're participating or whether they're victims of it, it's there. And so when we look at people who reject the gospel, even those who do it insultingly and harshly, you know, when you're on Facebook or Instagram or something and someone has like a snide, insulting comment to God, if you're like me, you eventually got away from it because I kept feeling my heart race every time I saw it. I'm like, I wanted to get mad at them for it. I'm like, how dare you have that opinion? How can you be so ignorant? How can you be so wrong? This person that I don't know from this town that I can't tell you in this state that I probably couldn't find on a map. How dare you have this view? Social media makes everyone feel like they're next door to you, even though they're across the country and you'll never interact with them unless you want to say something. Sometimes we can give ourselves a break because they might be victims too. They might have lost in a spiritual battle or are losing and they need help. Their view may be from real trauma and pain in this world from another scenario where they need prayer, and they need guidance, they don't need my animosity and condensate consent and condensation. Condensation is when moisture's on there. <laughs> Condemnation's not the word I'm looking for. What is it when you talk down to people? Condescension. Condescension. There we go. It's so close with those words. They really should spread those out. I have a couple more mouths. They don't need that from me. They may need my prayer, my servanthood, my heart. And this is important for you guys, because whether you like it or not, you are participating in a spiritual battle. If you profess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then good news, you're on the winning team. That doesn't mean the players on the winning team don't actually have to play the game. We have to serve our neighbors. We have to work in food pantries. We have to come to church on Sundays. We have to read our Bibles. We need to pray. We need to put in the hard work. 
Daniel was not living in Jerusalem. He wasn't building bricks, but he was working. He was praying. He was putting in effort. He was impacting the spiritual battle. And because of that, we have a witness of God's glory. And we have a prophecy that is so shockingly true that if you want to ever argue with someone whether or not God can predict the future, just go to Daniel chapter 11. We win. That's the good news. But don't forget that when you interact with our neighbors, it's not always the battles you see. They have conflict behind them. There are people out there who have gone to school and said, no, I don't believe in God because intellectually I don't think. Sure, there's a few of them out there. 99% of the people who reject God do so from an emotional position. When I deal with atheists or dealt with atheists in the chat groups, they always had the same response. I don't believe in God and I hate him because something has happened to them in which they refuse to believe that they could be healed from or that God could guide them out of or that they deserved or that they earned. They've lost the spiritual battle. They've walked away. But until their last breath is gone, it ain't over. They can jump to another team. They can come to the winning side. Because guess what? Next Sunday, Dolphins are playing the Patriots. <laughs> and there's a lot of Pat fans out there right now in this community. But as I said, until those clocks are at zero zero, those Pat fans can jump to the winning side. They can change their allegiance. I got hats and t-shirts and everything that they would ever want. Join in the good guys, the Dolphins. And that, that not only be an encouragement for you, not necessarily football, trust me, you Patriot fans, you can keep the Patriots. Trust me, I've been through 20 years of pain. You guys have earned your 20 years of pain. It's coming. Enjoy it. Um, oh, that's a tangent half right there. Oh, man. I'm going to repent for that comment. Lord, forgive me for making football so important in my life. Thank you. So, remember that. As you deal with your neighbors, as you deal with other people, as you watch the news and you feel heartbreak, you feel pain, you feel suffering, don't just look at the worldly trauma. Don't look at the worldly pain. Realize that there's a spiritual battle behind and that you impact it with your prayer. Prayer does something. Does a whole lot of something. You have the ability to help. If, you, if you're upset that there's so many homeless people, you can do like, and I'm so proud to say, South Parish Church in Augusta, my former boss, Sue Gain, who is the director of Fresh Starts, they've just converted their entire basement into a homeless overflow shelter. And they just got funding from the city of Augusta to do it. Because they saw a need. They saw homeless people that were sleeping in the lobbies of the police station during the winter because their beds are too packed. And they said, what are we going to do? And South Parish just got the state approval and state funding, or town, city funding, to turn their basement into an overflow homeless shelter. That's pretty amazing to see. And so God is working around us. We can participate in this spiritual battle. We have this ability just as Daniel did. Don't forsake it. But always remember who the glory goes to. That is a perfect segue into communion, my friends. I wouldn't even do my sermon prayer even though it's added. I shouldn't even have told you that because you wouldn't have known different. Becky would have. When we come to the Lord's Supper, it's easy for us to be reminded of the worldly conflict that came with it. As Jesus on Passover shared his final meal, his final earthly meal, with his disciples, he reminded us that he would experience worldly trouble, but in the process, he would create the spiritual victory. That his body would be broken, that his blood would be spilled. But in doing so, death would lose. 
So at this time, I would like you to take a moment to come up and collect your communion. And then as you sit down, we will do the communion service in proper. So at this time, you may come up for communion. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, just ordinary bread used to sop up the meal, but he gave it its true meaning. He broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for holding nothing back to save us. You are such a great and amazing God, and we are rebellious, rebellious people. Thank you for sending your Son to teach us, to instruct us, to encourage us, and to save us, Lord. We pray that all of our brothers and sisters are encouraged during communion. We pray that our hearts are emptied of any sin, animosity, anger, and frustration that we may have for our neighbor and our loved one, Lord, and that we reach out to you with a prepared and hopeful heart of the future. As we take this bread, let us be reminded of the spiritual battles that you've won, death lost on the cross, and we're promised that it will be over when you return, Lord, so we ask you to return soon. We ask this in your name. Amen. Jesus broke the bread. He said, take, eat, and whenever you do this in remembrance of me. See, Jesus knows that sin is a debt that must be paid. And that our debts are far beyond what we can pay for ourselves. The only acceptable answer to sin is death and blood. And so our Lord and Savior chose to give his blood for the remission of sin. When he was on that cross, he did it for us. 
Jesus took the cup. He said, take this and drink. This is my blood spilled for the remission of sin. Lord, thank you. Thank you for offering your son as a sacrifice to us. Thank you for your goodness and your greatness. Lord, thank you for glorifying him. Thank you for letting him walk out of that grave three days later, defeating death, so that we may know that it was a victory that happened on that day. Be with us, Lord, as we worship you. Be with us as we navigate this world. Let us remind all of those around us of your amazing power, your amazing grace, your amazing mercy, your amazing love. Be with us, Lord, for we ask this in your name. Amen. Jesus took the cup. He says, take, drink, and whenever you do this, remembrance of me. Amen. And now please take out your hymnals to our final hymn of the day. We come as guest invited. It's number 218. <laughs> Lord, be with us as we go out into this world. Keep us healthy and safe and protected. Look after us, guide us, and guard us in the ways of you, Lord, so that we may gather again in just a few short days' time. We love you, Lord. Thank you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you all, and may God bless you.